And I also, thank you, Jillian. Um, we'll also drop a link to a survey in the chat now and at the end of the event. This is a brief anonymous survey that helps us report back to our funders and direct future programming. So we really appreciate you taking time to provide feedback. I'm going to introduce you to the moderators of tonight's conversation, who will then introduce our panelists and dive into this discussion on the intersections of art and activism. If you have your own questions for the panelists, please save them for the Q&A session that we'll have at the end of the conversation, at which point you can drop them in the chat and um, one of our moderators, Sheree, will direct them to the panelists. Um, if you drop them in the chat during the conversation, there's a chance they could get lost and we want to be able to keep track of them. But feel free to drop positive comments in there and um, throughout the conversation. Um, and then following the question and answer session, we hope you'll join us for a brief time to reflect through writing about the impact of the conversation on our own practice. Uh, before I introduce our moderators, I wanna share our gratitude. This event was made possible through a grant funded by the National Writing Project as part of the National Endowment for the Humanities American Rescue Plan, Humanities Grant Making Program. I'm very grateful. And this conversation frames a series of programs coming out of this funding called Activism in the Archives. So tonight you'll hear from activist authors about how they think about responsibilities to the public as writers and as citizens. Um, and then you can put what you hear to practice at a poetry healing and activism experience, experience which we're planning in partnership with Black Earth Collective and Lab that'll be led by poet, local poets Ko Nyan and Justice Amir. It's coming up on Saturday, September 17th. We also wanna invite you to join um, our moderators, Frank and Shri and other members of our advisory committee for a further conversation at our monthly coffee chats for BIPOC creatives. The first one is Saturday, August 13th. And then on Wednesday, September 28th, I'm throwing a lot of dates at you, we'll be bringing together a panel of local archivists to speak to writers and artists about the archival resources available to you as sources of inspiration for your creative projects, and specifically artifacts that speak to stories of solidarity and activism in Rhode Island's past. And then wrapping up this programming, we're going to be putting out a call for poem, essays, and stories of solidarity that we're going to publish together in a zine. So stay tuned for all this great programming we're launching with tonight's conversation. All of these events will be announced over the club's social media at What's Your Club and in our newsletter. We'll get links in the chat so you can follow along and, and stay up to date. Thank you. So our moderators tonight, as I mentioned, are part of the club's advisory committee. And we're so grateful for their enthusiasm and insight that they've brought to dreaming up some really intriguing questions to stimulate tonight's discussion and allow us to reflect on its impact. So I wanna introduce Cherie Rowe and Frank Maradiaga. An English literature PhD student at University of Rhode Island, Cherie's research for her MA in education examined the transformative process of teaching, studying and practicing creative writing. Her creative work in progress includes a multi-generational novel set in post-Windrush Britain and a photo poetry journal. Outside of her writing and academic life, she directs and acts. Her next project is a public humanities theatrical project for Aquidneck Island. Sheree, do you want to just say hi so people can locate you? Hi, great to be here. Thank you so much, Sheree. And then Frank works as a journalist in Rhode Island's news market out of Cranston and Providence. He's the founder of Rhode Island in Color, a journalistic publication that aims to give the people of color in the ocean state the coverage they deserve. Frank, you want to say hello? Hey there. Thanks for having me. All right. Frank and Shree, I'm going to let you introduce our panelists and, and take it from here. Thank you to our panelists and moderators. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you, JD. Uh, I'd like to introduce Ifira Amsong. Afir is a postdoctoral scholar and artist at Mount Holyoke College. She received her PhD in English Literature and Creative Writing from the University of Rhode Island. She is an advocate of Black African women's voices. Her work interrogates representations of Black female subjectivities in African diaspora literature. She's working on a collection of poems about the material culture and poetic elements of the Adinkra symbols from Ghana. Specifically, she is recording how West African oral art serves as a mode of expression and survival for enslaved Akans in bondage. She has two chapbooks, Black Ballad, Try Kissing God, 
and American Mersey and has published work in Prairie Schooner, Four Way Review, Main Review and other journals. She's received scholarships from Breadloaf and Blue Mountain Centre. More of her work is at afia, A-F-U-A-S-O-N-G dot com. Afia, could you give us a wave? Thank you, Afia. Um, our next panellist is Eli Nixon. Eli builds portals and gives guided tours to places that don't yet exist or exist but call for creative intervention. They are a settler descended trans queer clown, a cardboard constructionist and a maker of plays, puppets, parades, pageants, suitcase theatres, drawings and low tech public spectacular. Eli collaborates with artists, activists, schools, mental health and recovery centres, libraries and the more than human world to expand imaginative capacity and build muscles for collective liberation. Eli's current creative efforts include parenting a 13 year old human, building a 450 million year timeline out of recyclables and supporting local and planetary movements for abolition, reparations and multi-species justice. Blood Tide, Eli's proposal for a new holiday in homage to horseshoe crabs was published in November by the Third Thing Press. Eli, would you give us a wave so everybody can locate you? <laughs> Thank you. And I'm gonna hand over to Frank to introduce our last but certainly not least panelist. Maria Hadessa Tally is the author of the award-winning children's book, Layla's Happiness, which I happen to have read to my daughter last night. Um, the poetry collection Strut and uh, Karma's Footprints and uh, Dear Continuum, which I also have. Um, actually, I have all your books here. Uh, well, not all your books, but a, uh, a representation of them. Um, she creates self-care posters and herbal medicines with her daughters and cine poems with her husband. She's a PhD candidate in the theater arts and performance study program at uh, Brown University. Um, Mariah Hadessa is the mother of three galaxies who look like daughters, which I think is lovely. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, yeah, we, we were we we're meeting back uh, before uh, we let the audience in, and there was this idea, you know, this. I think Eli said he doesn't feel like a writer. Uh, sorry, they don't feel like a writer um, because, you know, uh, Bloodlines was the blood tide. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, was the first. Um, endeavor in there. And so I have been thinking about activism quite a bit lately. Um, I started Rhode Island in Color and I'm still starting it. I'm still creating it. And it was meant to give the communities of color in Rhode Island the coverage, the nuanced coverage that I don't believe they're getting in the current um, news uh, sphere. And I love journalism. I, I believe uh, all the um, outlets that are there are doing good jobs. They're just not really, um, really capturing what it means to be a person of color um, in this state. And I just wondered, is that activism? Is, you know, I, you know, I, it's a journalistic publication. It's, it's presenting the facts, you know, as they are, but is my is my move to create that, you know, activism, you know, um, you're not supposed to have activism in journalism. You know, there, it, it's, it's, it's a fascinating concept, activism, because it, it's been ascribed to heroes and villains. It, it can be something noble or something treacherous. It just depends on your views, you know? Um, and so it's been typecast a lot as uh, people holding signs at 
you know, the steps of the state house, but it could also be layered in creative works um, that aim to be more than just pamphlets. And I think the writer artists who are here um, have a slice of that. Um, and I just, well, as a way of introduction, I, I, I last, um, a writer artist to just talk to us about their passions and, you know, what, what change they hope their work um, can, can create or what injustice they hope to write. Um, uh, Athena, do you want to go first? A little bit about your work and, and your passions and yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, thank you for that, Frank. So I, I thought a lot about, okay, what is activism and how does that relate to my work? Um, and I, I want to share a little background on how I began to write poetry. So when I was 12 years old, I moved from Ghana, which is in West Africa, uh, to the United States. And um, I moved and joined uh, my mom in the Bronx. Um, and we, with my sister, we just thought, you know, right? <laughs> uh, we just thought it was a short um, holiday session and that we were gonna go back. Um, and then we were here for six months and then we were here for a year and we weren't going back. Um, and I was only 12. And so moving from one country to another and having to deal with the culture, the language, um, one thing I dealt a lot with in the classroom was accents. People would be like, why do you speak like this? And then I would be like, why do you all also speak like this, right? So just learning to um, know myself um, was challenging for me. Um, and so I had an aunt in New Jersey who bought me a notebook. Um, and every single day after school, I would write in that notebook. Uh, the things that happened, the things that I was excited about, the things that I was that made me afraid. Um, I didn't know at that moment that I had began my move towards activism, right? Because I was the immigrant subject who was learning to cope with the new environment. And so when it became a reality to me that I was not the only immigrant subject coping with the new reality, I realized that then my work had to be published, right? And so for me, activism comes in the form of making an impact, right? Being able to share with someone work that will change their lives, right? Being able to share work with someone that they can relate to and say, oh, this is how you're going through it. This is how I can go through it, right? So in the Bronx, they are many Ghanaian immigrants, right? And they're immigrants from all over the world. And so every time I write a poem and I invoke uh, the immigrant subject, I invoke the African subject, I know that I am calling these people who are in reality into conversation with my own work and also with my own personal experiences. And I've gotten a lot of feedback from people who say, oh, I can relate to that. Thank you for writing that. Uh, thank you for sharing that, right? And so also with the point of being vulnerable as an artist, right? To make a social impact, you have to bear yourself out there in the world. And that's when people can take um, from you. Eli, would you like to go next? Um, sure. Just sort of orienting you to how I'm here. Yes. Um, I guess um, the book that I wrote is a proposal for a new holiday in homage to horseshoe crabs because it seemed like the that a book was perhaps the most sort of personal invitation I could make to other people that I wanna th think with and that I like invite to join me in my thinking around the um, sort of scarcity and shittiness of a lot of our holidays and what we're reinscribing in some ways and what are we lifting up to celebrate and what are the things we actually need to mourn together and where are places where we can gather our energy and what does a feast look like under different terms than Thanksgiving or you know like trying to detach the um very I think human need to celebrate to gather to mourn to to collectivize um and feel oneself a part of a larger we 
um, that I think a holiday does. And so writing a book and then having this miraculous editor, Anne DeMarkin, who works with Third Thing Press, having her say to me, if you can't write it, draw it, um, was a way that I felt like I could craft an invitation to almost to anyone with with trust that they'll put it down if it no longer resonates with them. Um, and as someone who's traditionally a performer and a um, facilitator of other people making their own art, their own puppet shows, their own parades and stuff, what I tried to do was write a manual so that anybody could feel as though they had the tools to enact this holiday, whether or not it was a feast or a cardboard costume or a parade, or if it was the first time they thought about reparations or being part of a movement towards building ecologies of repair that are connected to land and climate and racial justice and thinking about how do we move as a collective we into something that we are excited to pass on to kids of all kinds, to people who are coming next that like appreciates our ties to the more than human world. And then you layer on the complicatedness of the pandemic being the reason that I had the moment to write the book and also the moment that horseshoe crabs themselves are being really relied on because the FDA currently requires every vaccine and pharmaceutical to be tested against this compound taken from horseshoe crab blood. So the very real um, like urgency of this organism in terms of our survival, not just in the like cosmic, like here's an organism that's been here for 450 million years, maybe we can look to them for some survival strategies, but also in the, here we are replicating this pattern of extraction from another life form that suddenly alters what they're worth to who is us in this circumstance, any of us who are celebrating being more resistant to this virus, just feeling like it was an invitation to get complicated with me and with what I'm trying to pass on to my kids and feeling like maybe a book was a way to do that in like from my brain and hands to wherever it landed. And for me as a performer, that's really new because I'm used to then being able to engage with people directly. And this is like a weird time capsule where I never would have expected get the opportunity to be in conversation with you all hatching out of this weird spore that is the book on the wind that then opens in other places. So grateful to be here. I hope that answers some of your question. Of course, that's, that was wonderful. Um, Maria Hadessa, do you want to go? Yeah, thank you all for these beautiful answers, my gosh. Um, so I guess I'll go all the way back where I, I tend to go back. It's like uh, 16, right? I'll go back there. Um, I feel like that is around the time when I realized that I could be a writer, right? So before then, I thought I would be an architect like my father, but I had no um, math and science ability, couldn't draw, right? Um, but I was always reading. And so reading books, it's always, I, I always talk about the autobiography of Malcolm X, right? Um, work by Langston Hughes, and then work by Alice Walker, right? So it was like the Black Arts Movement and the Harlem Renaissance kind of just came to me in this way. And I thought, if these words make me feel like this, I could write and possibly make other people feel a certain way, right? Like one of the things that I was experiencing as a younger person was just like not being proud, even though I had parents who were very proud of who we are. But you know, oh, if only I were a little bit lighter, oh, if only my hair was a little different, you know? And Malcolm X changed that for me, right? And like Alice Walker helping me to understand that there's me, there's the earth, there's an us, right? There's this whole, this whole universe that is in, in conversation with each other. And so that was an opening, right? And I thought I've got to write, I have to do that. And I also thought then a lot about the fact that it would have been illegal for me to read and write, right, as a Black woman. And so that was one of the things I was like, hey, this is radical, right? And very much like Frank, um, I did do journalism. It was music journalism at that time. Um, well, a little bit later, I did music journalism. And I just, I would always feel like, wow, just having our voices in these spaces is so important. Now, if you fast forward to now, I'll just segue a little bit and say, I'm thinking a little bit differently about 
activism and what it looks like, right? Because very much like oh, yeah, I think of it as, and Frank mentioned too, I think of it as signs being in the street. Um, I've right, I mean, I know we've all done that at some point and probably will do it again. Um, but now I find myself thinking about other ways that um, I engage in activism. And I wonder too, like, am I doing activism or am I what Alice Walker says, am I just paying my rent for being on the planet, right? right? I, I wanna be in community with people. I want to create spaces where we can listen to each other. And so I can talk more about that, but the books were initially my jumping off point, but I've come to see them as solely a jumping off point, which is really different for me now, right? I, I'm very interested in performance. I'm very interested in visuals. I'm very interested in the conversations we can have. So it's like, yeah, there's a book, but it's a springboard. What else can we do from that book? So. Yeah, um, thank you. Those were all wonderful. Um, do you guys think of yourself as activists? I mean, a, a lot of this is personal stories. I mean, um, you guys spoke about it a little bit, but you know, was was there a moment where you said, "I," you know, you felt like the outsider, the um, and and you said, I, "I I need to be that change," I, I, or or is it just reflected? In your work because of your reality because you can't escape who you are and um so i you know that was a little bit rambling but i'm saying is did you is this a mission or is it just a reflection of of how you like to see the world anybody could you know jump in um that's such a great question um, when I'm like with my pen and paper, I'm not like, here's to change in the world. Um, and the first thing that came to mind when you were speaking was the word pioneer. Um, and sometimes being an activist means for me personally, being the one to start something. Um, and so in my family, um, I'm um, the last born, the last child, and usually the last child is given the opportunity to sort of explore. Uh, Mariah Dessa, you were talking about how you you didn't get to be an architect. I was like, I went from doctor to architect and all of that, and then I finally landed on poet. <clears throat> but I think a lot about Phyllis Wheatley Peters, and um, I took some time to really read her work and study her um, as a grad student. And I think of her as an activist, right? If so, so if she's an activist, then I'm an activist too, right? So she's an enslaved um, African who comes from the Senegambia region and is um, in the New England region. And she decides that I want to write and not just that I wanna write in a diary and put it um, down, but I wanna write and I wanna get it published, right? right? So publication becomes the mode in which her voice is heard in which she's able to um, deconstruct a lot of the uh, racism and discrimination against her people. And she pushes for that, right? She sits in a room surrounded by uh, white men who don't feel that she has the authority to have her voice out there in the world. And she says, I deserve to have my words out there in the world. And she chose poetry to do that, right? And so once she, once I look at her as an example of pioneering um, and making the black woman's voice heard, um, and, and my ad, that's when you talk about it being illegal in the classroom, right? I see her as someone to look up to, right? If I wanna be um, a black African immigrant woman um, in the United States who wants to make an impact here and um, on the continent in, in Africa, I need to make sure that my words are out there. I need to make sure that my words are published. And so I think I do think of myself as an activist in that way. Eli or um, Mariah Desha? Um, I'll, 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 I'll say something there. Um, I was waiting for Eli because I'm like, they, your stories were so beautiful. Um, 
Yeah, it's, I think my relationship to this word, again, it's, um, I have so much respect for people who, see, there's that music I told y'all about. You hear that? <laughs> Get it? Okay. Um, I have, no, I have so much respect for people who do put themselves in the street. Like I think about Ida B. Wells. Frank, when you were talking earlier and you asked the question, you know, is doing journalism activism, I think about Ida B. Wells, right? And her office being bombed for the work that she was doing with the, her newspaper, right? I mean, we know that it, journalism can be activism, right? In the right hands. But I have so much respect for people who do that sort of work, who organize people en masse, right? Um, people who go out into the street. I, I do have that so much in my head. Um, I don't organize people in that way and I don't go out in the street in that way, but I am deeply influenced by activist ethos, right? Like deeply influenced by that. Like the black arts movement is the thing that let me know I can do this. If I'm trying to inspire folks to love themselves, right? This is poetry, this is a way to do that. And so I feel like I'm on a mission, right? Sometimes um, my husband would say, okay, you're out there spreading the gospel, right? <laughs> you know, and, and, and that is, that's a lot of different gospels, right? Those are gospels against oppression of people for race, um, gender, um, um, sexuality, all those things come up, right? They come up in my work. So I do have an activist ethos. I just have so much respect for those folks who do put their bodies on the line. And so, yes, I'm, I'm inspired by activism, right? I'm definitely inspired by it. And I'm an activist inspired poet, right? But now I'm, I'm just kind of like, mm. but I think an activist does something a little bit different than what I do. And that's not me putting myself down. That's actually me like in my lane going, these are the things that I do, All right, so. Yeah, thank you both for going first because I feel like you helped me figure out what I'm going to say. Um, I think I am, I think there's parts of me that I'm an organizer. I organize with showing up for racial justice Rhode Island and I am a supporting member of the Behind the Walls Coalition at Direct Action for Rights and Equality. And I feel like um, that's where I feel an, an organizer self of being like, how can more people come into this conversation and feel its relevance and the need for everybody's freedom, basically. And then I feel like my artist self is the part where I get to move in a different kind of logic that is about, um, that's maybe a little more, um, when I think about the art I make, whether it's a book or a puppet show or a parade, I think of it as a little more um, evangelizing about what's working for me personally. It comes from a like, the organizing is how we get all the bodies where they need to be to create the noise that needs to be made. Whereas the art feels like it speaks to the spirit of what keeps me going. And, um, and I think that figuring out how I can be like, oh shit, as I draw these cartoons of animals and I'm thinking about anthropomorphization and the ways in which if we decenter anthropocentrism through anthropomorphization, we can like find new ways that I am the cow that I'm drawing the cartoon of, or like I'm able to transcend things that in normal, regular, everyday human logic don't work, but because it's art, it has the spirit, it has the magic. And I feel like that's where I feel like I'm probably more effective at bringing other people on board, whereas I feel like the organizing stuff feels a little bit more like when you like pay your parking tickets and do like, it feels a little bit more like this is the maintenance that we need to do in order to keep the movements running in the directions that they have to go, but it's the, um, it's the art, it's the writing, it's the drawing, it's the theater, it's the gathering with other people, which is where I'm like, oh, here's the world I'm trying to be a part of. This, this is the new world that I'm hoping our organizing is like leading us closer to. Thank you, you guys all had some um, wonderful phrases like, uh, you know, the, the magic, you know, uh, spreading the gospel, um, you know, having an experience uh, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, 
marginalized people. Um, uh, I, I just wonder, and you guys all achieved what most writers want, which is publication. But um, what were some of the uh, sort of blocks in your way um, towards getting um, this, you know, the spreading the gospel, you know, uh, the magic? Um, I remember we were in a group um, that what year helped uh, put together for uh, the BIPOC community. And um, Maria Desha mentioned how long it took for Lelo's happiness to get an artist. Um, and I was amazed by that. She said, and she, you know, she could jump in. Um, she said uh, it took about four years. Um, uh, she wanted to um, hold the door open for somebody else of color and she wanted it to be drawn it's a it's a, it's a picture book it's a children's book um by a um, an artist of color and she gave a list and the 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 powers that be rejected it and it, i think it was about four years but i i just to all of you um what were what are some of the roadblocks that you faced in in getting your the gospel out there And of course, anybody can jump in. <laughs> if, if we were if we were all in person, I would just point you. How about you? <laughs> um, yeah, or I'm, but I'm just yeah. in, Frank, because you mentioned yeah that that struggle, right? I mean, I know everyone. Half of the people in this room are writers, so it's. Uh, I mean, there are gatekeepers, right? We all know there are gatekeepers. So um, trying to it's is a level of persistence, right? Um, there's a, a there's a level of persistence that's necessary, right? There's a level of um, you have to keep going. That's that's part of this whole thing, right? You have to keep going, and you you build community. And when you build community, sometimes doors begin to open, right? I often talk about. I tell students of mine, I don't like networking. Like people say, oh, network so that you can, right? It's super transactional, and I I I don't. I'm not into that, right? I mean those. I think activism is a way. Let me say that, right? I think activism is a way and it's a way that you do everything, right? So we build community and then maybe someone says, I'm gonna start a journal. Would you like to put work into that journal, right? And so, okay, we get together, we, we put some work, we put some work out, right? So I feel like the, the I mean, I just have tons and tons and tons of rejections and still get rejections, right? Um, so persistence is, is one of the things, it's one of the main things. Um, yeah, if you don't go the traditional route, if you don't go like through certain institutions that vet artists and then open doors for you, if you don't have certain type of mentorship, um, right? You, you, you know, you don't necessarily know all this when you start this, otherwise you might never damn well do it. But, uh, right, I mean, come on. It's like, yo, I'm just gonna be stuck like this. I'm just gonna be stagnant. I'm just gonna have stuff in my drawer forever, right? So. Yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of rejection. And when there are not a lot of folks who look like us in those rooms making those decisions, right? People who don't understand what it is we're talking about, or they claim they don't understand what it is that we're talking about. They know what the hell we're talking about, you know? But maybe they want it to be spoken in a certain type of way, right? So it, it's, it's, it's just the constant gatekeeping that we have, that, I mean, we come up against. That's what I would say. That's just constant. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, oh, you, you, I'll you mentioned- I'll say, I get, sure. Oh. I mean, I, I will say that what got in my way was um, thinking it was a play before, like I thought it was a play before it was book. And that was confusing because I was writing it as a play and it was a bad play. And it was, um, I was using horseshoe crabs and red knots and trying to figure out how language came out of these characters. And it felt like I was just recolonizing these primordial forms with English. And then being like, man, if this crab is gonna speak, it's definitely not speaking in English. And it's not in a language I can understand. What kind of play is this? And then it became a dance piece. And then it was about rhythm. And I was like, oh, this is really out there. And then luckily, I would say I got lucky. I mean, I think that what what got out of my way was my own self, perhaps, and my, my lack of a vision that it was a book. And luckily, my friend saw it and was like, you should send this 
play to these people who could make it a book. And she was like, great, we'll publish the play. And I was like, ah, why are you going to publish a terrible play? It was a bad play in the first place. Now it's going to be a bad book of a bad play. Like, oh, and that's what birthed I think the constraint of it suddenly being a book was what I was like, well, shit, if it's going to be a book, it better be something that actually takes advantage of the form of a book. And I was like, well, what do I need? I need a manual for a new holiday. And so then I wrote the manual that like came out of the play. And then it was like, ah, this makes sense in this form. Um, so I think forms are what sometimes stand in our way. Is it like you have I think um, you were just talking about this, but like that it's almost always I learn relationships over projects, it, like the projects come and go and the relationships grow and morph into new things. But the relationships of people who trust that you have something to say or something to do and then finding the form that catches that particular thing at the time feels like I just got lucky that there were a couple of people there trying to catch it and then that it got published felt like a fluke. And then the fact that now it's leaving the page and becoming a sculptural installation and dance and a project and a weird holiday at a goat farm. And like it, it was briefly on the page. And now I think it's becoming other things, but I'm like, great, run with it. <laughs> I did also want to add that um, uh, Joy Harjo has said something about um, poetry being a calling. And so, um, uh, Maria had as I said something about you you have to be uh, persistent right and so um for me I'm always reminded about why I do this thing and so like I recently got a rejection maybe on Tuesday and the funniest thing is I read the email and I was like oh <laughs> and it's like I've gotten so many rejections and I wasn't sure whether I was dealing it with with it well or I, I had too much on my mind but I was like this is this is not going to make or break my work, right? This is another thing that would have helped, but it's not going to make or break my work or stop me uh, from writing. And also when I started publishing uh, ch chat books, I didn't know that you had to like sort of work on your own like artist and cover page. I, I just thought these are my poems, work with the poems. But um, I remember I wanted to have a, a painting from a Ghanaian artist. Um, and I didn't realize those things cost money, um, a lot of money. And I reached out to uh, a museum who had her display and I was like, hi, I'm Ghanaian, please see attach my poetry chapbook. Can you, and then they were like, no. And I was like, you, did you even read it, right? Um, and so I think that finding that community to trust in your work is also like a challenge where you're like, okay, poetry is important for the Ghanaian community, especially. Um, it's harder for them to see poetry as life-changing, as impactful. But for the few who have read my work, they do, they do tell me that it has been a safe space for them. So those have been my challenges. Yes. Um, Frank, I, I just want to throw this in based on what um, Eli and Afia are saying. Um, I, I, and maybe you have, you have something to say about it too. I'm thinking a lot about process. Right? Like I've become somewhat obsessed with process. Like we're talking about our books, right? And I think the books become products um, in, in the world, right? They become something that people can sell um, buy and sell and then you know it's the gatekeepers again and blah 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 but listening to Eli talk about their process and realizing ah this is not this this is this this is not this this is not this and listening to Afia also talk about all right well I wanted to put together a book but I started with these chat books I don't know are y'all also finding like for me that there's um there's beauty in process and in somewhat kind of starting to reject um, everything having to be a product, you know what I'm saying? Like it's only valid if it's a product, but if we're in circle together and we read poems and we make dance performances and we talk, that's valuable, right? Like I, I'm just, I don't know, maybe I'll have something to say about that, but yeah. for me, it's a shift. It's a, it's a real shift in my head. I, I told, so when I started writing poetry, I never ever thought of having my work published. 
um, until I got into my MFA program and I needed to figure out what I was making of my career choice, right? And so my thesis advisor sat down with me and she's like, oh, you want to teach um, and on, on the college level, you need to make sure you have publications, you need to make sure you have a book, right? Right now, if you're applying to um, tenure track positions and you don't have a full length book, they're not even going to consider you as a poet, writer, fiction writer, nonfiction writer. Um, so for me, I, I do believe they're not, I don't publish all my poems. Um, there, there, there are the notebooks that no one is going to see, um, but I do think there has been this system that forces writers, artists to, to show their worth through publication. Yeah, I just want to chime in on this process train um, about, uh, I think one of the things that I struggle with as a first time author is the, um, is the feeling that, that I was very much in process. This was at the point of publication, it goes, and there's ways in which, you know, the editor did the layout and I'm like, wait, there's no horizon line on any of the drawings. So I still like, I'm drawing in horizon lines as I'm si signing people's books. And like, I'm still like, oh, I would change that word. And like, I feel as a performance maker and as a clown, I'm like, I can't believe I don't get to change it now. I've like had six months of thinking since it's been published. And now people think I still think this is the thing, but it's, it just feels vulnerable and good to be like, look, people, this is where I was at when it went to press. I'm at a different place now. And like, I hope you can join me there. And like, I'm sure you'll take it in a way I never imagined. But I think trying to like hold it as a as a snapshot of a moment um, helps me release it as part of the process and be like, okay, that's where it went. Maybe there's another edition. Maybe there's a second version. Maybe I ditch it and write a counter proposal later. Who knows? But like, just trying to like be vulnerable about the fact that like, what's not in process? If it's not in process, it's probably dead. So I don't know. I guess I, I like lean in into that all around. I agree with all of you. Um... Creative work has an important impact on on the community, even if no one's making a buck out of it. You know, um, sitting around, you know, telling each other our truths. You know, having a space where where um, we're accepted and we're not the other in the room um, is so much more valuable than getting sixteen ninety nine or whatever split you guys actually get after after everybody takes their their cut. All three of you mentioned community, mentioned relationships. And so I just wondered about the obligation of, of an artist writer. Um, if you're a writer, an artist from a marginalized community, um, do you have an obligation to advance your community or just advance your work and your vision? Um, you know, uh, what do you guys think? Like, you know, someone, uh, a person of color should try to, well, actually, I'll, I'll let you guys answer. What, what, what do you think the obligation is uh, of an artist to, you know, who belongs to a um, marginalized community to the community? I think um, what comes to mind is, for me, if when I was growing up or as a 12 year old Ghanaian American, if I saw more women like myself, Ghanaian American or West African women in poetry, I would not have been so afraid to, to step into that space. Um, it took me a long time, even as a college student to um, declare my major in English because I didn't know how to explain to my parents what I would be doing as a poet, 
right? I knew that you would write poems, but what what else do you do, right? They were like, how much would you make <laughs> as a poet? Um, what do you like, where do you where do you go to work? And I'm like, you know, you, you sit in your corner and, and write, right? And they needed to see that I would leave the house and that, that has totally changed with work from home now, but they needed to see that I was actively doing something. And being a poet sometimes means living means traveling means having conversations with people because that's how you get inspired and that's how the work comes um and so i do believe that i have a strong obligation um, to be an example for other black girls other um, african Ghanaian um, young women who want to step into the creative space but are scared because they don't know how to do it. Um, um, Sheree and I, we recently went to a public humanities conference and um, I'm applying for a seed grant to lead workshops in Ghana because that's what I believe in, bringing poetry back to the nation, right? And also lead workshops um, at Mount Holyoke where I'll be starting in the fall. So I, I see... Uh, it's this, this is the mission, right? I have to bring poetry back to the people. I have to let people know that poetry is a powerful tool and we must use it. Um, I think, well, with community, it's interesting. I, I It keeps going back to love for me. <laughs> I think about love a lot, um, all forms of it. Right, all forms of 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 love, not only romantic but family and community, and I think that the thing that's behind the work that all of us are doing when I listen to all of us is love. And so I don't really think about advancing a community because I don't think I can advance. Like you know, it's also like, what does that really mean? Like I think about uplift. You know what I mean? Like talk about uplifting the race. I think about Du Bois. I think about a talented 10th and I've got a problem in my head if I start thinking like that. You know what I mean? It's like, no, no, no. We all are bringing something to the table. And so I think a lot of times like that, for me, my role is to, to share, to share stories, right? But in order to open space, like I, I realized that, like I'm sharing some things, but I don't just sit down afterwards. It's kind of like, so now what? You know, I always say my favorite part is the Q and A when I talk to college students because then we can really, we can really get down, right? We can really discuss the poems or discuss whatever's going on with them. Um, so I feel like what what I'm interested in is sharing, learning to be a better listener. Um, learning to open space um, and helping us dream, right? Helping us imagine like new realities. I love that, um, Eli, that they, you said about um, the new world. Like, that's completely what I'm interested in. Um, and so I, I feel like that's what I want us to do together. And I want us to laugh together, shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's another thing. Like we can cry together for sure. We can rage together. We could do those things because we have to, but I also want us to laugh together. And I think healing, I think if it, healing is a huge part of, of the work that I'm doing. Now, what that means, however, is going to be different for every person, right? And also I'm healing myself, right? So yeah, I would say love and healing are like the, the word behind the word. Yes, um, so much. I, I um, wanna, this conversation makes me think about this uh, wonderful moment with two folks I know, Julia Zumi and Diane Xavier, and we were talking in a class that we were all in um, about rep sweat and this term um, where if you haven't heard before, it's rep sweat as in like representation sweat, where say you're a person who's seeing up your identity as a marginalized person enacted on stage and you start to sweat for them being like, or the writer is someone who matches your identity and you're like, oh, I hope they do a good job for us or whatever, like this rep sweat feeling. And I think that what was helpful about the conversation I had with them is the reminder that 
if we're starting to feel rep sweat, if I'm as a trans queer person feeling like, oh man, fellow trans person, I hope you're repping me white. I'm still centering the gaze of the straight cis oftentimes white male, like I'm still being like, oh, I see through your eyes, I hope I stand up. And I think trying to shed that measure of whether or not it's working or if it's good and being like, whoa, I'm making my stuff for me and for whoever feels held by it and resonates with it. And if it doesn't match your gaze or if there's some other trans, trans queer person who presented a completely conflicting reality, that's because we're all unique individuals. And actually I don't have to rep a whole person based on a white male straight cis gaze that, that I only represent slices of and that I'm trying to disrupt within myself. And so I think that's useful. And then I also think that um, what, I, what I'm excited about and the places where I feel most alive are when I'm in the climate justice conversation about art as my anti-racist white trans queer self having a conversation about the plastics burning port that's proposed for the Port of Providence is like, that's where I'm like, uh, hey, these are all of my weird identity ten tentacles are activated, some as the fuckers who are trying to put in the plastic plant, some as the people who are resisting it, some as the people who are going to have weird health effects because I have asthma, you know, like, like the fact that we are all multitudinous and any paradigm that tries to make us the thing that needs to rep for everyone who's supposedly like us, I resist. And I um, buck the idea that we can't hold multitudes and that we don't need, and all the more reason why we need to keep shaking up who's the voice of those who are oppressed or unheard or whatever, and be like, whoa, we're just not listening to all of the ways that voices are out there and here and in here. I guess that's where I go with that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for uh, joining us. Um, you know, this, we could have gone so many different routes, but I, I love the slides that we got from all of you. Um, before we, we move on to Q&A, um, which some of you like, <laughs> um, I just like to give you guys a little little time to, to mention the impact you've had on your, uh, that you've seen from your work. Like maybe, you know, a young poet comes up to you and says, uh, you inspired me, you know, um, just what are the nice little moments, you know, to end on an upbeat <laughs> note that uh, your work has, has, um, has birthed in the world. I'm glad to start there because I have a very concrete invitation to anyone listening and anyone else, which is that um, this proposal for a new holiday in homage to horseshoe crabs attempts to desettle the sort of settler colonial lens of time starting when white so-called white people arrived here and that anything historical or America or whatever starts after that and be like, whoa, 450 million years people that like, we're really trying to like hold the whole thing without skipping over the harms of more recent ancestors or the pleasures of more recent ancestors, but actually hold them all at once and a meanwhile and a future. So realize the um, sort of settled relationship with time as linear and as um, fixed. And so the invitation to folks is to come build this 450 million year timeline in the Providence Public Library stairwell with me, um, which grows directly out of the book, which I've been in with the Pawtucket Boys and Girls Club and New Urban Arts and Movement Education Outdoors and the Feinstein Early Childhood Center. And any of you who want to come over the next couple of months, we're building all the flora and fauna that we can. And we've had a bunch of tiny modern humans build tiny modern humans, which are gonna be the, the four, first of the library at 2022. And then we go up to the primordial past slash future if time is a loop or whatever. Um, and that, that will be ongoing for the next several months. And that's a way that I feel like I'm hoping, I don't know if anyone here is here from the library, but my, my um, internal, trajectory towards this thing is 
the library, as far as I know, doesn't currently have a land acknowledgement around what the land it's sitting on top of. It doesn't currently have a recognition of the black bodies whose labor built the museum. It doesn't have, I mean, the library, it does, there's a lot of things that it's leaving out of its own of our collective urban history around this um, center. And I'm hoping that through this very welcoming process of like, come build a flounder, paper mache a reindeer, look at the ferns, we can get back to like, and then where, where on this massive timeline does, are there some ruptures that we need to name and that we need to like acknowledge as part of understanding our collective need for healing and our collective attachment to this massive timeline of organisms. So I'm hoping that the book breeds an invitation that feels open and then lands back in other stuff that in the book, if people are like, oh, I don't know, I can be like, well, let's check out the book, read the section on reparations. So we'll, we'll see how it goes, but I'm trying to do a dance in between the like, tactile, we're transforming recyclables into art where we're like decentering the human, but then it goes back to merit very much the humans that are walking up the steps and whose memories are not being recognized and whose land is not being acknowledged. How do we move between these like abstract notions and the very concrete real world implications of these social constructs that are keeping us all tied here in this crazy webs? So I guess that's my answer is come build organisms with me at the library and then you're helping me enact this weird holiday as an ongoing, it's a floating holiday, which one can enact. My whole proposal is that you use it anytime you need a holiday, which might be Tuesday afternoon at the library. It might be instead of Thanksgiving, it might be instead of a birthday that feels too old for you to celebrate or a shitty holiday like Columbus Day or you know, like any number of things that need to be unsettled and flushed out with perhaps a 450 million year organisms perspective. So that's where I, I end my invitation to you all. Well, I'm absolutely showing up and creating some stuff. Who wants to go next? Yeah, um, there's been a lot of instances um, where students, high school students um, that I've taught have come to say thank you. Um, but there was this one moment where I worked with seniors um, in the Bronx, so 60 plus. Whenever I say seniors, I have to clarify because people think it's high school seniors, but it's actually like seniors, seniors. Um, and these were all women of color. And um, it was a three month program of um, poetry and West African dance. And I remember when I would teach them dance and I would be like, let's go on our knees. And they're like, you gotta be careful because we don't have strong knees, right? Um, but they would be so excited um, just to learn. And I thought that I was there to teach them because the goal was to teach them poetry, how to write their own memories. But they would teach me rather, because they would tell me stories. And I was like younger, they would be like, don't do this child, don't do this right. I was very mothered um, during that experience. And I would be like, so let's move on to the next. And they would be like, not ready to move on. And then I decided just to let go and enjoy that experience. Um, but at the end of the, the program, they create a, an event where they, they will showcase the dance and we created like a little chat book that they could share with their family. Um, and I invited my sister um, because every time I'm leaving the house, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do a poetry thing. I'm gonna do a poetry thing. And it seemed like she never really understood what I was doing. And so at the end of the program, she looks at me and says, good job. I know what you're doing now. And that to me, was everything because she's my older sister. Like she expects so much from me. And I I then fell at that moment, okay, I'm making an impact. If Karen understands what I'm doing, <laughs> I can I can chill. Um, and so that 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 for me has been a moment that I, I keep a lot whenever I feel down or when I when I feel like you know I'm not reaching um, the masses, right? You 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 can start reaching people right from your own house. So yeah. Um, I think I'm going, I was going through my mind and then I got stuck listening to these amazing stories, but I think about, I went to the University of Mississippi 
And I did a reading there, which is powerful for me because I have ancestry in Mississippi. And so, you know, I did this reading in this room. It's at a university. Students are there. You know, professors are there. Okay, so the reading is finished. And you talk to people. And this elder comes up to me. And he tells me that he wasn't there for the reading because he doesn't really understand poetry. And he says that his daughter writes poetry, but he doesn't understand that. He was actually staying because he was gonna walk his colleague, one of his coworkers home. The brother was um, on the janitorial staff. And so he said, but I understood your poetry. And he was like, and I liked it. And yeah, that meant so much to me for so many different reasons, right? It meant so much to me. Um, yeah, so that let me know that maybe what I was doing was all right. Wonderful, once again, thank you all. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, my colleague, uh, Cherie. Thank you, Frank, for such wonderful moderation of, and the questions that you posed to the panel. Oh my goodness, um, I'm tearing up here. Um, I've got, I'm going to start off and, and maybe working with the idea of the love and the healing, um, but also the idea of sustaining yourselves in those moments of joy. Um, and Michelle, um, asks the question, how do you each stay hopeful in the midst of so many societal challenges? especially these days so can you give us some some tips some hints something that that works and that's um that's such a powerful question um so i there are different ways generally speaking i tend to think a lot about my ancestors right and our ancestors but my ancestors in particular, and then I think out to folks who just had, they just kept going, right? I, I, there's this line, I remember I heard Haki Madubuti read a poem and he talked about how our ancestors saw us and that was the thing that kept them moving. And so I try to think about like what I want for my children what I want that and that's all of our children right like what I want for the planet um and then there are times recently where I you know because children give me a lot of hope I don't intend to put a burden on them that they got to fix the world that's not what I want for children it's more like I think I would like the world to be a better place so what can I do um when Uvalde happened um and the children were murdered and no one is being held accountable. I will tell y'all that I lost a lot of everything. I, I don't even know what to tell you, but, um, and so what I did was I rested, right? Like I looked at what was going on in the news. I understood what was going on and I understood that we have a much bigger job than maybe even I thought. And I rested and resting gave me hope, right? I'm not saying I laid up in my bed and curled up. I'm more saying that I did things that nourish me. So if that's going to the beach, if that's writing in my journal, if that's crying, holding my friend's hands, right? Like I'm big on crying, right? Um, those were some of the things that I, that I did. And now I'm, I'm able to, to move forward, right? So yeah, I, I recommend rest actually <laughs> sometimes. Thank you. That, the importance of self-care before you can carry on healing each other. It is it's, it's critical. Thank you for that. Thea? I guess I just want to yeah. hold up the uh, hold up the natural world as um, like when I'm feeling so depressed about humans or about my kind of humans, whatever I mean by that in the day, or um, to think about how like sloths uh, have uh, their own microcosm of moths that live in their grooves of their fur and they've figured out whole eco interspecies eco ecosystems 
of thriving with these organisms that are wildly different sizes and have different blood chemistry and different eating habits and all this stuff. And here we are as humans, like it makes it be like, God, we have so much common ground, actually. We got, we all got, most people got two legs. Like we got actually a lot to start from in terms of um, once I, when I ground myself, so alienated or so frustrated to be like, okay, where is the art that um, I think I look out at the ways in which people of all kinds of people and all kinds of cultures find joy and find healing in each other and in themselves. I think I, I just need to put on a good Mavis Staples song or I need to like, you know, relax into the, the feeling of um, the water washing over me at the beach or things where I'm like, I am so small. Male is, a, is really just, just this size. I got five, two and three quarters worth of problems. But like that, I think that helps me keep things in perspective um, and not make myself the like swirling white chaotic center of the world that is just like, don't you know how fucked we are, which isn't going to bring anyone closer to anything. So if I can like recalibrate myself as like a tiny sliver in a tiny time span that like gets to be here on this miraculous planet with these incredible artists or these fellow friends or my sweet family or whatever, I think it helps restore me to be like, all right, I can go make this stupid flyer or I can finish this chapter or I can, it may, it helps keep the job in perspective. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to add that um, this idea of just being aware of what you have in front of you or the body um, just today, right? And so I'm a person who likes to like plan a lot. I'm just like, okay, so by the end of the year, I would like to have, and then next, and then I'm just learning to live for today, right? So when you plan ahead a lot and it doesn't go the way you want it to go, that's when you get really frustrated, but there are a lot of things that are out of our control. So every time I catch myself trying to plan too much into detail, into the next future, I say, oh, but you have today. Have you finished living for today? And then I calm down like, oh, okay, maybe I can like get ice cream, you know, <laughs> and just really enjoy my day because I'm already moving into tomorrow when I haven't finished today. And that's like depriving myself of all the 24 hours. And so just really calming down and say, oh, this is today. That call I can do tomorrow, right? There's still a lot of hours left in today and I will enjoy every single minute, second of it. And then tomorrow I can do what needs to be done tomorrow. Those are wonderful words of advice and guidance. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, and I guess also in the sense of sustaining yourselves, how do you also, Denise has asked, how do you keep your work fresh? How do you keep those, those ideas coming? Well, sometimes they don't come, right? Um, and that's okay. I, I really feel that it's important to say that. I, I, I don't keep my work fresh, I don't believe I do. I believe that I'm often saying the same thing over and over and over again, but perhaps in different ways. And then sometimes I just sit down and get quiet, right? And that's okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, you know, I, Afia said it's important living, right? As poets, we're here to live. So I guess if we are keeping our lives fresh by being present, by being in conversation with each other, and the natural world and recognizing our place here, then it is natural that things will flow, right? But understanding that everything has seasons, there are ebbs, there are flows, and it's okay if you don't always have something to say. Yeah, and um, being patient with your work and knowing that it's not always going to come every day. Um, the only time where I have written consistently for maybe a week or two was when I had a deadline to submit for 
uh, my second chapbook contest, but I'm not writing every day. I'm writing at 3 a.m. when I should be sleeping and an idea pops into my head. I'm like, oh no, not, a not again. And I take my phone and I'm just like, you know, half awake and half asleep and typing um, that on. But it really just when you're living, when you're having conversations uh, with people. So recently, um, a friend of mine lost her mom and we went to um, something in our culture called the one week where the family gathers to talk about the decisions for the funeral. And I just watch the way people mourned, right? So watch the way everyone has a different way of grieving loss. And a poem came to me and I asked myself, is this something that I have permission to write or is this something that I just have to observe um, and take in? And so really just being in the world, um, acknowledging the world, being present in the world um, is, is how I get my ideas. And I'm not always having a pen <laughs> and a paper. Sometimes my brain is brewing over it and then, um, one time I'll sit next to a desk and I'm writing five to 10 poems and then that would be it for a while. Thank you, Fia. Yeah, I think Afia just tapped in this too. Um, I feel like for me, the thing that keeps it fresh is what I, what I need from it. Like, am I, like, what am I there? If I'm there to prove to you that I've done a good job thinking about this thing, it's already dead. But if I'm there because I'm like, oh, I still need to engage with you, mysterious audience, whoever you are, whether you're a reader or someone sitting in a chair or someone watching the parade, there's still something that I want. Like I, I'm looking for dialogue um, of some kind. Like it matters that it's outside of me because otherwise I can just stay at home and like stew and muse. And that's an important part of it. But I think when it starts coming out, it's like, I, I need what the outer world is gonna bring to this, some other thing of feeling witnessed in my struggle with this question or in my celebration of this organism or in my something. So I, I think again of invitation, it feels fresh when I feel ready to be like, like you don't invite your friends over to your house when you're a mess and it's a shithole and you didn't got, buy any groceries, but, and that's not when I'm making art, but like when I'm like, I got this thing, it might be weird looking and unfinished, but I'm ready to like have some other people's hands on it or eyes or like have their questions bounce off it. It feels like where it stays fresh to me. And I think the other thing that I would say that keeps it fresh um, or keeps it like living in me is um, trying to reject what academia, what professionalism, what white supremacy teaches me as like the appropriate form for things. Like this is an appropriate place for this question or this is an appropriate way to ask this or to present this and trying to break free of that and be like, fuck, if I need to draw a cartoon or I need to type this thing wearing fringe sleeves or I need to put on a costume and scream and then I'm gonna write a weird dance or like just trying to be like, what are my actual ways in and trusting that other people need those too because I'm not that far away from other organisms with this many arms and legs and these kind of eyes and like trusting that the, that the tools that I need to latch on to a like, exploration of meaning, which I guess is what we're all doing is trying to be like, hey, I'm feeling a meaning or something about this. Like it has a gravitational pull that you wanna bring others around with you, even if you don't know exactly what you're saying about it. Feels like a freedom I'm interested in like building with others is like you can, we can be in process together and art is an invitation or books are an invitation to be like, here I am in all of my unfinished multitude welcome and then, and if the I think if the invitation is authentic people bring whatever they got and then it's way more interesting than whatever i had in my own little corner thank you that's um that sense of uh continually asking questions being present in the world uh, uh, leads us to the next question by tom um and tom asks is the goal of art to inspire artistic sensibility in others so that they too might find their own artistic voice? That's a big question. 
I'm going to chime in this other private message to me that Tom sent just because I'm feeling the pressure of it being <laughs> private. Um, where are you? It's saying, are you saying that writing succeeds only when it becomes a catalyst for community dialogue, which I think is a similar question. Sure. And I would say just off the cuff, no, I'm not interested in success personally. It's not a metric I am concerned with because I don't feel like usually those who are determining whether or not something is successful, unless it's like a blood test or something where there's like some data where I need to know that I got to stop eating something or whatever. I'm like, success is a construct along with a bunch of other things. But I feel like it's successful when I feel like I'm building relationship and connection with people and further truth is being revealed that that helps me be be freer that helps me find what I'm saying. So I would say that's what what I'm after. Yeah. I would I would also say I define the success of my work um if it inspires a conversation. Um it doesn't necessarily have to create writers um but i want someone to think further about a subject right and think about how they can find it in their own lives and keep thinking about it that might cause them to change careers cause them to love to forgive um do so many different things but if they become a poet that's like the icing on the cake but it's i don't think um I write, I write to create poets or writers, no. Thank you. I've got another question that um, perhaps connects to that. In terms of your voice, um, if, it's, if your voice is performance art, Tom says, how important do you feel reading your poetry, poetry aloud is in the general goal of healing wounds in our culture? And again, that perhaps connects the idea of building collectives and communities and not necessarily having a product but actually sharing and telling each other and sharing with each other yeah i would i would say that i think reading work is really important for me right it's not it wasn't always a joyous thing to do i found it um petrifying by the way i you know um absolutely terrifying to read work um but what i find now is that it's just a great way for us to be in space with each other so that is what i like like i don't see performance as performance necessarily anymore i see it as a facilitation and i'm bringing something and i'm hoping that you will pick that thing up and work with it and play with it and dream about that and we can go on from there, right? So yeah, I think performance is, is extremely important. I don't know, and think about the fact that you don't have to have money sometimes to go to certain performances, right? Sometimes you do, but sometimes you don't, which is also why I think film is important, right? Video, audio files, like all that stuff that you can just make and upload and anybody can have access to it. Like all that stuff is important. Another what another way to skirt the gatekeepers. So yeah, the voice is really, really important, I think. Tom, that's a great question. Thank you for those responses. I'm very conscious of time. I want to get two more questions in. Um Mona, um, Mona has asked us, do you ever go back and edit something, whether it's a poem or a story or a, a dance that's a little older? And if so, how do you feel about doing it? And I think Eli talked a little bit about consistently kind of revising and editing. I only revise when I'm like at a reading and I'm, or I'm preparing for a reading and I read it out loud or um, after the reading, I'm like, I don't, Think this is how I wanted it to sound or it sounds better right and so I make the edit and then if I read that poem again I make sure I read it as the new poem and not what is already set in stone um, in the publication and that's also one thing with publication and Eli talked about that once you have it in the, on the paper and print that's it right you can't make any additional revisions 
um, unless like you sell maybe a million books and you want to do reprints. I don't even know how that works. Um, but you really do need to take time before that the poems are out or before the final project is out because you want to make sure that it's in the voice that you intended it to be or else every time you read it you're just going to be kicking yourself like oh, I could have spent more time you know doing this but yeah revision I feel like revision is constant but it's different from when it's already published versus as you keep on reciting or performing or um, reading. Fia, thank you. And one last question um, before I know that we've got a we've got a, another practice. But um, Anne just asked, do you ever feel too small to write in a world with so much big stuff happening? Um, and if so, how do you keep your spirits up? I'll I'll answer that because one of my favorite um, one of my many favorite things to do that I write about in the um, manual for a new holiday and homage to Hershey Krabs is making time capsules. And I think that um, a similar principle applies where you have to trust that you're a fractal. I don't know if anyone's read a pattern language um, and that anything you do in the smallest pattern is a, is a, is like you're trusting that that pattern is replicated by multiple other patterns. And that's why it matters that you're kind to the checkout person or it matters that you tend to your garden because it's about taking care of the space where your feet are, or it matters that you pay reparations to the people who are on the land where you stand, even though you can't solve chattel slavery or that it matters like that a pat that you can start with an increment that is as small and as close to your body as a way you breathe in in the morning and trust that that's having an impact on all everyone that you breathe on the rest of the day and um and i think that i that really keeps me going a feeling of like okay my muffin wrapper is much like anybody's muffin wrapper and all i can't I can't concern myself with making the glorious muffin for everyone to enjoy. I can only deal with like how I take care of this, this piece that is entrusted to me that is must be mine because I'm here. So I've got to tend to it. And then um, I think that is where I feel a sense of freedom to be like, I trust the rest of the people who happen to be on this wild orb at the same time as me. And some of them are wiling out in ways that I'm like, what are, you're, you're my same species? What are you doing? And then the bulk of people, it seems like, are like, I'm just here trying to survive and care for my people and feeling like, okay, I'm one among many. If I just am responsible to this slice, then I feel less overwhelmed about as if I have something to solve or that it's all up to me or anything. And I think the time capsule thing relates there because if you think you're trying to encapsulate all of time, you'll never fucking make a time capsule. It's totally overwhelming. But if you're like, I'm making a time capsule of Pawtucket, Rhode Island on Thursday night at 745, and this is what I got right here, and trust that that might have resonance to whoever opened it, whether they have hands or tentacles or space probes or whatever the fuck it is later feeling like okay i'm i can just rep this, this again the rep sweat feeling of like whoa we don't have to stand for anything other than our actual embodied experience and i think that's enough that's a lot of information right there we're inspired by our fractal by that fractal imagery thank yeah. you so much i know that we have to say goodbye to afia she has to um, share her wonderful knowledge, expertise, and activism as an author um, with her students. So I wanted to make sure that we thanked Tafia. And Nancy has actually commented, she just wanted to say how much she appreciates the emphasis on collective and connective experience among you all. So we're going to say goodbye to Afia. I didn't get that. Could you try again? That's Siri interfering. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you.
there we go. Um, so now we have a writing reflection that I want to share. Thank you for the questions and for the comments. I hope I did a good job of capturing the majority of them. Um, we're going to stop recording just so you feel comfortable in this writing reflection. And I'm just going to get my screen.